Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. Sorry about that. Joni, could you forward the slide, please? Thank you. And we'll get started in about a minute. Just be punctual. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you're coming from. All right, we're right at the top of the hour. I say we go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. It's very nice to have you virtually with us. Uh, we're coming, Joni and I are coming to you from New Jersey. So this is Using Psychiatric Rehabilitation Strategies for Long COVID uh, Recovery Part Two. So welcome back if you joined us last week. If you didn't join us last week, that's fine. We're gonna do a quick review. This webinar is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC, housed at Rutgers School of Health Professions, Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. And I'm Michelle, and I will be doing some of this stuff uh, at the front end, and I will be co-presenting with Joni. Next slide, please. The MHTTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to enhance the capacity of behavioral health workforce to deliver evidence-based and promising practices to individuals with mental health conditions. We also address the full continuum of services spanning mental health prevention, treatment and recovery supports, and provide training and related uh, services to workforces such as police, first responders, primary care providers, vocational services to provide effective services to people with mental health conditions. And we utilize supplemental funding to support school teachers and staff to address student mental health. Next slide, please. The MHTTC provides training and ed technical education and assistance focused on evidence-based practices for people with serious mental health conditions, including illness management and recovery, supported housing, supported employment, and supported education. We also address comprehensive school-based mental health services and supports, wellness and recovery for people with mental health conditions and for providers, mental health and recovery among Hispanic and Latina, populations, and online self-paced education courses recovering some of these topics. Next slide, please. We deliver our free services by providing resources, toolkits, online courses, trainings, webinars, and intense technical assistance in both English and Spanish. Next slide, please. If you'd like to keep up to date with all of our activities, please sign up to receive our electronic mailings. You can sign up by scanning the QR code on your screen. Um, and you can pull out your phones and take a picture, which will sign you up if you'd like. Next slide, please. Following the webinar, we're going to ask you to complete a brief survey. We value this feedback very much, and we use it to improve our activities and inform future activities. The surveys are also really important because our continued funding is linked to the completion of these surveys. So we thank you in advance for your help and feedback. Next slide, please. We are recording this uh, webinar and it will be posted on our website within seven days. Next slide, please. Do note that this presentation was prepared 
for the Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC under a cooperative agreement from SAMHSA. At the time of the presentation, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman served as Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at SAMHSA. The opinions expressed herein are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS, SAMHSA, for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. Next slide, please. We do encourage you to interact with us uh, during the webinar. Joni and I are both very interactive folks. So we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to uh, hear whatever you have to say. Please engage with us by using the chat function. You can also raise your hand, uh, pose a question in, the, in that format as well. So please do interact. We'll be asking lots of questions and hope to hear from you. Next slide, please. The MHTTC is committed to using affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. Next slide, please. We also want to let you know that the new uh, three-digit dialing code for the Suicide and Crisis hot li uh, Lifeline is now available. 988 is more than a suicide crisis line. It's for people experiencing suicidal mental health or substance use crisis or any kind of emotional distress. It's also for people who are concerned about someone who's experienced a crisis. You can connect by calling or texting 988, or you can chat online at 988lifeline.org. Calls, texts, or chats are responded to by a trained crisis counselor. Next slide, please. And hey, that's us. Uh, we've got Joni, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions at Rutgers School of Health Professions. Joni has several years of experience working in behavioral health care settings, namely supported employment. Joni teaches courses in the department's undergraduate program, as well as providing training and technical assistance to behavioral health care providers. Her research interests include staff training and employment services. She presents nationally on the topic of employment services and is listed as a society for Human Resource Management recommended speaker on the topic of creating workspaces that support mental health. And I am uh, an assistant professor. My name is Dr. Michelle Zechner at Rutgers, and I've been working in the areas of health, wellness, and self-care strategies for over 15 years. My work is really focused on helping people living with mental health conditions, their families, and the staff who support them. I've worked in a variety of settings, including community and inpatient mental health settings, nursing homes, and in-home services. Currently, I work on providing training and workforce development for a wide range of health professionals, and I teach and conduct research. Next slide, please. I think I'm going to turn it over to Joni. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so just to, to review our objectives for this afternoon or morning, wherever you're coming in from. We're going to do a very quick review of long COVID and its related symptoms and some of the functional implications. We're also going to examine the impact of long COVID for people with serious mental illness. Michelle's going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we're also going to dig into the real meat of our presentation today is looking at psychiatric rehabilitation strategies that can assist individuals in attaining recovery goals. And then um, similar to last week, we are going to look at how you can apply some of the concepts that we talked about today in your own work experiences. So just a very quick review of what we talked about last week. We introduced long COVID, um, really looking at those symptoms that continue well beyond the recovery from the illness itself. Um, as we mentioned last week, or if you weren't there, not everyone who gets COVID will experience long COVID or post COVID symptoms. Um, but we, Michelle and I, were, were really thinking that this could be an opportunity for us from our psychiatric rehabilitation perspectives to really look at how providers in behavioral health and psychiatric rehabilitation can use your skills and your experiences um, to assist individuals who may be experiencing long COVID symptoms. Some of those symptoms might 
be those physical symptoms listed here, including tiredness or fatigue, some respiratory or breathing symptoms, uh, also neurological concerns or challenges that people might be facing uh, due to long COVID, such as some brain fog, concentration limitations, um, inability to think clearly, some depression or anxiety. Some people may also have problems with sleep and then also executive dysfunction. And we'll, we'll talk uh, more about each of these or some of these symptoms and their related functional implications. So those limitations that develop from these uh, array of symptoms. And we reinforced last time, but just to reinforce again, Michelle and I are presenting this from our perspectives as psychiatric rehabilitation educators. Um, we are not scientists, scientists looking at long COVID in terms of the physical manifestations, but we're really looking at it more from our lens of supporting individuals to um, identify assistive strategies, that can help them achieve recovery goals, achieve goals that are important to them, uh, despite some of the symptoms that they may be experiencing. So we have a quick poll. Um, Michelle's gonna bring it up. Uh, just true or false, if, if um, so thinking about compared to the general population, people with serious mental illness are more likely to contract COVID. So you think that's true or false? Okay, so looks like most of the responses are in, so I'll end the poll. And here are the results, so, you know, 60, uh, 64% yes, uh, they agree with that statement that compared to the general population, people with SMI are more likely to contract COVID. And then uh, we had about 36 responding that that was indeed false. So Michelle's going to talk a bit about some of the um, information that we found regarding people with SMI and long COVID. Michelle? Thank you, Joni. And we did have a question about if there will be a certificate for attendance, and there absolutely will. We'll give you more information at the end of this. Um, and I do see a question. Um, that's a great question. There's a question, has the ICD-11 been updated to include diagnostic criteria to inclu uh, include long COVID? I think that's a that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I. I would think that that's a great question, actually, and it, it should be included if it hasn't yet, but I don't know. Joni, are you familiar? I do know that um, the ADA has, um, up, has, I think, July of 2021 now considers long COVID um, protected under the ADA. But again, you know, we provided lots of those resources in our um, appendix here in the presentation, so you can get some additional information regarding that. But in terms of the ICD, I, I'm not sure. So we're going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about the prevalence of uh, long COVID for people with serious mental health conditions. Um, actually, they are at higher risk of contracting uh, the illness. In fact, it, some reports suggest seven times higher, that people with serious mental health conditions are seven times higher um, at risk of contracting the illness. They're also two times more likely to be hospitalized for severe symptoms than the general population. Um, they're also twice as likely to die from COVID as people who don't have serious mental health conditions. And that number is even higher for African-Americans or, or Black Americans, um, even as compared to others who might have other risk factors such as heart disease, high blood pressure, or COPD. And as we mentioned last time, and, and I think we it bears repeating that many of these um, 
types of risk factors are found not only for people who have serious mental health conditions, but they're also in the general population. But people with uh, serious mental health conditions often have additional um, co-occurring disorders. Um, there's been a little bit of research that also suggests that people who are vaccinated who have a serious mental illness are also at higher risk of contracting the illness and being hospitalized and dying, despite the fact that they have a vaccine. That's not to say that people shouldn't get the vaccine. Uh, it's just underlying the, the fact that people with serious mental health conditions are at very high risk for uh, experiencing COVID. Um, next slide, please. Now, last time that we met, there were a lot of questions about resources and research into this uh, topic about long COVID in people with serious mental health conditions. So I did a brief literature review and noticed that what we do know is mental health uh, symptoms uh, before one gets COVID uh, if so someone has depression, anxiety, worry, or perceived stress and loneliness, that's associated with a 32 to 46 percent increased risk of long COVID. So mental health symptoms before means that someone's more likely to experience uh, long COVID after they have COVID. The challenge is that then COVID comes along and all of the, the difficulties and functioning that we talked about last time, we'll talk about this time, um, in terms of cognitive functioning and physical functioning that people with serious mental health conditions often experience, this may be amplified by COVID. And then they are likely to develop long COVID symptoms. And there has been some suggestion in the literature that there's a link between inflammation um, in mental health symptoms and also in long COVID risk. So while I think we're going to have to draw an inference here to assume that people who have um, mental health, serious mental health conditions are experiencing long COVID in higher numbers, there's not a lot of research right now about that. And I think that if we have any researchers that are watching, that's an area that we need to definitely look into and understand. And maybe you all have some great experiences with that as well. So next slide, please. So let's talk about the um, let's talk about the guiding principles of recovery very briefly. We talked about these last time. So Joni and I really come at this from rehabilitation practitioners. We are dedicated. We've dedicated our careers to helping other people move forward in their lives despite their mental health conditions. And the more you know, we talked about this, and we felt that these guiding principles of recovery uh, that have been put out by SAMHSA would be a wonderful way to frame services and interventions for long-term COVID. And those are things like having hope, finding different ways to recover or many pathways that it's driven by the individual. Um, it's also has peer support. It's holistic. It covers all the dimensions of wellness and is com comprehensive. It addresses culture and the services should also be aware of potential trauma and medical trauma, as we talked about last time, and noting the person's strengths, having some respect uh, for the person and building a really strong relationship. So I'm going to turn it over now to Joni. Great. Thank you, Michelle. I think that helps to move us into our next discussion, which is um, really looking at psychiatric rehabilitation and identifying what those strategies and solutions are to assist individuals who are experiencing symptoms related to the mental health condition um, or in our case today, we're going to talk about how we can use psych rehab strategies and resources to address long COVID symptoms. So what is psychiatric rehabilitation? Um, it's been around for, for a number of years now, and I just listed some of the goals and values that you can read here, but it really, PSYR, psych rehab services are designed to assist individuals to achieve recovery goals, to live in, um, to live full and integrated lives in their communities, doing things like working or going to school or uh, socializing. Um, a lot of, of these goals and, and are accomplished through skills teaching, uh, helping individuals 
identify resources and supports that can that um, can help the person live in the community. Many of the principles that are not listed here, but many of the principles of psychiatric rehabilitation um, help to kind of facilitate a lot of these activities. Uh, they're based on strengths. So looking at a, a strengths focus, um, peer and natural support. So helping individuals identify uh, peer support or, or natural supports in their lives. Uh, also focusing on wellness and that um, achievement of recovery and community oriented goals. So a lot of, a lot of services within psychiatric rehabilitation are evidence-based such as supported employment or supported education, permanent supportive housing uh, are really designed to equip individuals with skills and resources to achieve valued social roles in the environments of their, of their choice. So we're going to get into some of those specific strategies that Again, in this very brief webinar, we're not certainly able to address everything, but just to give you some resources, some skills, some ideas on how to assist individuals who might be experiencing long COVID symptoms or those uh, functional implications of long COVID symptoms. So we're gonna talk about, Michelle's got, going to dive into functional assessment and what that means and some tools and resources that are used to help us really assess the, the functioning of, of individuals and, and to get a better understanding of, of their, their functioning level and how we might be able to support them. I'm gonna talk about some smart goal planning and skills teaching, and then we're going to conclude with identifying some resources and supports uh, that are helpful for individuals experiencing these long COVID symptoms. And again, we're, 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 we're framing this under long COVID symptoms, but many of the symptoms that we're talking about are in fact symptoms of the mental health condition, or they can be sort of ancillary symptoms or um, effects of the pandemic itself, such as grief or depression or anxiety. So, you know, we're, we're framing it under long COVID, um, but certainly these can be applied to individuals who may not be experiencing those long COVID symptoms. So Michelle is going to talk about some different functional assessment tools. Thank you, Joni. Yeah, I love the uh, World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule, which is called, uh, the short name is the HUDAS. Um, they have a second version, so that's why it's 2.0. Uh, I've used this in some research uh, looking at physical activity, but it's really, uh, I think, a great overall tool because it's free. It's easily accessible. It's in the resources, so you'll be able to quickly download it. It looks at health and functioning in six different areas. Um, it looks at cognition or understanding and communicating. Um, it also looks at mobility, moving, getting around, self-care, including hygiene, dressing, eating, or staying by oneself, getting along with others, different life activities like domestic responsibilities, leisure, work, and school, and being able to participate in community activities. It takes between five and 20 minutes uh, to administer. And the nice thing about it, and the reason I like it so much, it has a, a self-assessment, it has an interviewer assessment, and then it has sort of a com uh, combined one. So uh, you can go to the website and check it out. It, it's very nice. And I think it fits well with the combination of health problems and uh, possible mental health conditions as well. Next slide, please. We also, I don't know if we have any occupational therapists in the uh, audience, but occupational therapists are awesome. And some of their work uh, and surveys are very helpful. Uh, the one that I have uh, listed sort of an example here of the Lawton Brody Instrumental Activities of Daily Living Scale, which is IADL for short. It has eight questions and uh, it looks at different areas sort of around telephone use, shopping, food preparation, housekeeping, laundry, transportation, medications, ability to handle fi uh, finances. It's been validated and used extensively with older adults, particularly when um, 
folks are being discharged from hospitals. It may be a great tool for people who are more compromised physically um, or experiencing a lot of a lot of symptoms from long COVID. The other um, measurement I do want to mention, I couldn't put anything up there because they, they don't have a beautiful survey established, but I have in the link uh, an article you could click on and see all the questions for the Independent Living Skills Survey. And that came out of the University of California at San Diego. Um, and I believe it's uh, from, oh, I think, oh gosh, I'm, I'm not going to say that. So I this was developed for use with people with serious mental illness. And it really covers very specific questions that may be more uh, relevant for people who've had a long history of mental health conditions, including hygiene, appearance, care of possessions, food prep, uh, health, money management, transportation, leisure, job seeking, and job maintenance. So that's another option to consider if you're looking for an assessment. Next slide, please. And lastly, I wanted to uh, give you uh, an example of one of the long COVID um, scales that are being used and the one that is e easily available is called the COVID-19 Yorkshire Rehabilitation Scale. And that has a 22 uh, questions. And I, I put a sample question there. Uh, please rate the severity of breathlessness in, in different settings. Um, I like this particular one because it does uh, look at the domains of the activities and participation, uh, participation of the international classification of function. So it does have the ICF uh, codes when it they thought about delivering. It was developed by the University of Leeds. Um, and in order to get it, it is free, but you do have to register. So you would just go to the website and that's also in the resources and provide your information. There is a second COVID uh, scale that's that was recorded in the literature called the Symptom Burden Questionnaire for Long COVID or SBQ dash LC, but that does require licensing. So I, anything that I um, offer here is things that you can find from the literature easily or by Googling, because I think that that's a lot more practical for those of us working in mental health. Um, and I welcome in the chat, has anyone else using any kind of functional assessment that you find helpful? Just drop that in the chat. I'd be curious to see if you've used one of these or if you use other validated functional uh, functioning tools, uh, I think that would probably help other people as well to know what you're using. So while you're thinking, next slide, please. So when we think about psychiatric rehabilitation, psychiatric rehabilitation is really about helping people recover and it's how people re sort of aligning. And I think that Joni's going to talk about that in a minute, uh, the goals and values of psychiatric rehabilitation. But we want to make sure that we're really philosophically on board with the person while we're doing assessments. So one of the key foundations of this is to collaborate with the person, to see them as your partner as you're doing them. I love to do self-report surveys with people because it's sort of an opportunity to really uh, remove the glass wall, because if I'm asking, you know, I've done a lot of assessments in my day, um, but if I have my clipboard and my pen and paper, that's, that creates kind of a, a wall between myself and my client. So if I am with the person and we review an assessment together, it's a much more participatory uh, experience and it gives the person a lot more agency and power to include it. Another important feature about these assessments that we're talking about is really focusing on the situation or the environment. So, um, um, in psychiatric rehabilitation, we really care about what's going on in this moment. So if someone is experiencing long COVID or symptoms of psychiatric symptoms, we want to make sure it's targeting their specific needs and desires. We also want to orient uh, the person to the procedure so they know what's going on and instruct you know, them to offer you know, what they need to do in that moment. We want to use our active listening skills. I know you all probably are amazing at that. Uh, to really listen so that the person feels heard and respected. Also, we want to make sure we use standardized measures. We use a lot of tools in mental health. Some of them are things that our agencies develop and others are validated. So the tools that we've offered here are validated tools that have been shown to have good reliability and validity. 
We also want to make sure that we stay positive on the strengths and challenges of the individual. Of course, we have to know about the uh, challenges, but really thinking about the strengths. What do they have? Are they are they uh, enthusiastic? Are they creative? Do they have resources? Do they have family who will support them? And highlight those skills and resources that they have, which uh, Joni's going to talk about now uh, additionally. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So we we talked about psychiatric rehabilitation, some of the, the goals and the aims of psychiatric rehabilitation. Michelle introduced functional assessments and some different tools that you can use to really assess um, skill area and, and, and assess the, some of the needs for individuals. So now we're, we're going to get into once you have done some of those assessments and um, people may have had SMART goals prior or other goals prior to, um, to maybe experiencing some long COVID symptoms or just you know pre-pandemic, the goals might've looked very differently. So this is a good time now to revisit some SMART goal planning. And, and we use the SMART goal planning um, framework just as a, as, a, as a way to teach goal planning in our course coursework and other trainings that we do. You may use some, some other types of, of um, goal planning, um, but, but we're, we'll talk briefly about what SMART goal planning is and how um, it could be helpful when you're working with individuals. So let's move into kind of identifying some of the characteristics of, of SMART goals. Um, when we're thinking about individuals that we're working with, um, you know, again, someone may have had a recovery goal that now after, you know, the last couple of years, maybe that goal is not what the person is interested in or, 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 um, or engaging in at the moment. We want to not assume that the, the goal is static, but these changes over the last couple of years may have um, altered those goals significantly for people. So, you know, this could be a reminder to, to really sit down with someone and begin focusing on um, what some of their current needs are, what some of their current interests are, um, and using this framework, the SMART, uh, S, Goals should be straightforward, emphasize uh, what the person wants to have happen, um, be very specific in, in, those, in those goals, um, also measurable. So what are some of the, how, how can you measure or help the person measure the progress that they're making in um, their, their goal planning? It should be atta attainable. So the, the goal should be um, you know, require some effort, but certainly something that the person is able to achieve. Um, realistic, so not not something that's so far away and so long term that the person is unable to really even see the reality of achieving that goal. So you may need to help the person identify some short term goals. Um, you know, again, it's not something that's easy, but something that the person is able to do. Um, and then timely, so providing that real clear target that the person and, and the practitioner can work toward. Um, and, and this is, you know, SMART goal planning has been around for a long time, and I think originally developed in the management fields, um, but has since kind of transferred into other areas of healthcare and mental health care. Um, so these may even be this may even be a framework that you can use as providers if if your goals right now um, are you know kind of off or or have altered because of the pandemic. So some recovery goals that people are are interested in achieving are around employment, education, living, community, health and well-being. So um, Someone's goal might be to regain employment. Maybe, maybe they had um, had to step away from their job due to long COVID symptoms. So, our uh, role as practitioners can be to assist the person in identifying strategies to reattain employment or how to retain employment that they may be in, and and maybe um, 
need some supports around that education goals. So the pandemic or some of the long COVID symptoms may be interfering with employment goals. And, and maybe now is a time that the person is interested in achieving an education goal. So again, as Michelle mentioned, when we're doing some of the assessments, really sitting with the person and listening and um, using your active, great active listening skills to hear what the person's current needs and interests are. Um, living, social, community, and, and health and well-being goals are also important recovery goals. Are there other recovery goals that you may have been working with individuals on uh, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, you can just use the chat. But we do have a scenario that we wanted to get your feedback on. It looks like there might be something in the chat, Michelle. Yeah, I was just smiling. Someone um, noted, yay, Carl Rogers. So absolutely, a re rehabilitation yeah. is a Rogerian approach, meaning yes. that we're really connecting to the individual and a humanistic approach of, of acknowledging the person where they're at, wherever that is. So this is a fictitious scenario about a, a person named Gerald who had been talking with you about his goal of improving his wellness. He specifically discussed his interest in increasing his weekly exercise. Uh, however, he's about four months post COVID and expressed to you how fatigued he is. He spoke with his physician who seems to believe that this fatigue is a long COVID symptom. How would you assist Gerald in modifying his goal plan based on his current situation? So his original goal was to improve his wellness by increasing weekly exercise. So what are some ways that you would assist Gerald now in modifying his goal based on his current feelings of fatigue, um, experience of, of this long COVID symptom? You can use the chat or um, unmute your mic or raise your hand and we can unmute your mic. But let's hear from you. So someone is saying uh, to do what you can mm -hmm. might be a modification. So, so kind of going back to Michelle's assessment slide and, and helping Gerald to identify what are his current, what can he currently do? What are some things that he can currently do and help to uh, work with him to, to identify a goal plan based on that current level of functioning? And Joni, can I jump in yes, too? Um, I think for that particular goal, another area might be to explore when Gerald feels he has the most energy mm -hmm. um, and maybe to plan for uh, trying some kind of movement while he's feeling more energetic. And also maybe to consider the kinds of activities that he's doing to get some kind of exercise and, and to see if that might benefit from a modification of some type or additional uh, support. So I'll just give an example. Let's say, Gerald, I'm going to a yoga class, you know, and it had been particularly challenging. Um, one simple idea would be, would it be possible to consider a shorter class or a seated chair yoga? So that's, you know, specific to that topic, but, but really exploring with Gerald exactly what he's doing, what he wants to do, what would help him feel successful um, for that using the smart goal planning. Sorry, Joni, just had no, some thoughts. <laughs> I, I, think that's, I think that's a great point um, because we want to kind of go back to those recovery principles. We want to help Gerald to, to continue to feel hopeful. We want to help Gerald to um, identify, just like Michelle said, those um, intermediate goals or objectives that he can be doing to fulfill this overall goal of, of increasing his weekly exercise. Um, so you're, you're helping him to really focus on his strengths, focus on the skills that he does have, the resources that, that he has. So we want to constantly be thinking of those principles as we're working with individuals. Anything else in the chat that we, okay, so we'll move on. So we had met, we had spoken last time about functional implications of um, certain symptoms related to long COVID. 
we have these listed here, what it might look like, so what you might see. And then I thought we could look at and, and get your um, the group to, to engage with this activity, really look at what skill or support might be assistive. So one of the functional implications um, is an inability to concentrate. So someone might have a long COVID symptom of brain fog or other, um, uh, you know, other long COVID symptoms that's impacting their ability to concentrate. And that looks like not being able to focus on one task at a time or for a long period of time. What type of skill or support might be helpful for that individual? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, and the question is, what skill or support would help someone to concentrate? Mm -hmm. Oh, so someone says grounding. Thank you very much. Yes. So maybe teaching some grounding skills. Mindfulness is another mindfulness option. Mindfulness skills, absolutely. Um, a support might be having um, something on, on their phone, uh, some sort of alarm that they can use, um, you know, to kind of stretch out maybe the time that they're concentrating, if they could kind of use that um, if they're having a hard time focusing, maybe you know it could help them move from task to task or maybe have, um, you know, if, if the concentration is exacerbated or the lack of concentration is exacerbated by loud noises and being, if they're working, maybe they can wear he headphones with some white noise or some other soothing music. Maybe that would help, help the person concentrate on the task at hand. So someone who has decreased stamina, what might be some of the, um, what, what it might look like, lack of energy, can't stand for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time, what are some skills or supports that might be helpful for this person or to address this functional implication? Joni, I'm going to answer this yes. one while people are thinking. Yes. Please put those in the chat. But I'm wondering if it might be something like uh, learning how to pace oneself mm -hmm. and, and recognize the symptoms of um, lowered energy so it, while doing a task that, you know, using Gerald's example, if, if he's uh, working out, maybe there's a early warning sign of... Uh, when he's about to really lose, what are the early signs of uh, losing some stamina? You know, maybe some shaking legs or uh, extra, you know, sweatiness or something like that. Yeah, and maybe as part of that kind of assessment, Gerald could be encouraged to maybe journal some of that and keep kind of a log of times and, and what sort of experiences he's he's feeling when that begins to happen, absolutely. And then anxiety, so some of the difficulties breathing, or maybe someone's having a have, having problems starting a conversation with others, what might be some of the skills or supports that could help in those situations. So um, I think the grounding or you know, meditation or other kinds of mindfulness activities could could help with those um, breathing concerns. And we just had a comment, teach how to engage rest. Yes. Excellent. And digest states through yes. breathing. And then problems starting a conversation with others. People with anxiety may have uh, social anxiety, may have difficulties communicating with workers on the job or uh, fellow students or friends. Um, and that could certainly be a skill teaching, uh, assisting the person in learning how to start conversations. Maybe there are different apps that someone can download in, in terms of supports that can prompt different um, discussions. So, you know, so there are some apps that kind of have different 
um, ideas of what people can talk to, to, make small talk about. So those are some other options. And then some of the executive functioning concerns, um, planning, organizing, remembering details, making decisions, using planners, using electronic planners, pen and paper planners, um, you know, really working with the person to look at their organizational skills and assessing that and helping the person um, learn some of those tasks involved with organizing. So maybe grouping or clustering different items together that might help to organize um, some, of, some of what they're, what they're having difficulties organizing. So again, this is kind of just a framework for you to use when you're thinking about what skills or supports might be helpful. So we're so we're going to go with skills teaching as another strategy. Um, Bellac and and colleagues developed a social skills for schizophrenia workbook, um, which is you know is, is certainly applicable for for all you know for other skills outside of social skills but this they really highlight social skills but they kind of go through some of these um steps when you are working with someone to um help the person learn different skills and the aim of skill development is really to help individuals kind of restore functioning um, that may have been lost due to long COVID symptoms or other, other reasons. So here are some of the steps that are included. So helping the person establish a rationale for learning the skill. Um, and preface this with, you know, if you aren't using a book like the Bellac book, it, it, we've referenced it in the back. Um, it's really a, a helpful guide and it provides lots of resources. I thought there was a, an updated version, but uh, certainly you can look at our resource section, but as, you know, what, what's the reasoning for learning the skill? So what would be the reason uh, for, for an individual to, to learn the skill that you're assisting them in, in, in learning? Um, what are the steps to the skills? So really kind of breaking down what's involved with each of those skills. So kind of thinking through uh, different skills, you as a practitioner can be modeling the skills. So teaching the person what, what that looks like. So in terms of making conversations with fellow employees, breaking down the skill might be um, first identifying a topic to discuss. Second might be um, you know, identifying how to break into a, a conversation that's already going on. So how, how what are some of the, the ways to to break into that conversation, um, how to maintain eye contact. So kind of breaking down those steps of the skill, modeling some of those behaviors of the skill, encouraging the person to try it out. You could be providing feedback, asking their permission if you can provide corrective feedback. So asking if, if um, you know, if, if you could, could offer some, some corrective or critical feedback. Um, encouraging them to, to try it again, using some of that corrective feedback. Um, and then, you know, it gives some suggestions if you're using this in a group, but it really is important to encourage the person to practice this out in the community or in the environment where they're going to be using the skill and then following up uh, the next time you meet with the person. But this is a, a framework that you can use and you can get some additional information through that BELAC book. Um, so we have another brief scenario. So this is Cheryl, and she's about four months post-COVID, and she's having some difficulties uh, on her job as a librarian. And one of those uh, job duties she has is reviewing the databases uh, to research new books, gather new articles, and other resources for the library's uh, database. She does this by going through book reviews and keeping up with uh, publishers announcements and so on. She's experiencing brain fog um, and having a hard time concentrating on this task. What are some skills that you can teach or explore with Cheryl to assist her with this? So what is the skill? Maybe you can answer that. So what would the skill be?
think about what are the steps of the skill and how would you model the skill? So what would be a skill that you can assist or teach Cheryl? So, so someone, Joni, sorry, has said slow down, the skill of slowing down. And maybe that's sort of uh, being able to sort of uh, identify the steps of the process. That definitely helps us slow down. Do you have any thoughts about that, Joni? Yeah, I agree. I think that's, um, that's a, you know, identifying that skill, what it looks like, what does slowing down look like? That might be, um, you know, checking off a task after it's completed or checking off, you know, a, a, a behavior of that skill once it's completed so that Cheryl knows that she can move on to the next skill. It looks like there's something else in the chat. Uh, yes, breathing techniques to clear her mind. Yeah, cl clearing, your, clearing her mind, some breathing techniques. Great. So we should move on because I do want to make sure we get to looking at some resource and support identification. So thinking about resources and support. So um, part of psychiatric rehabilitation is helping someone identify those skills and teaching the skills Like we just reviewed a uh, very uh, cursor, cursory review. Um, but now what are some of those resources and supports that might help the person achieve those goals? So what are some ways that you assist individuals in identifying any re resources or supports that might be helpful in their attainment of community goals and recovery goals? I know my my primary role is working in an employment institute. And when we work with providers, the, some of the resources that they identify are, um, you know, what are, what are some of the transportation needs or what are some of the transportation options in the community? What are some of the supports that will help someone, um, you know, different job accommodations so different types of of accommodations that might help the person on the job. So kind of really looking at what are some of those supports and whether or not those supports are natural supports. So supports that could be addressed through the family or friends or people that are natural coworkers in that person's life, or are they professional supports? And Joni, we actually had someone comment peer support. Yes, peer support. So encouraging peer support. Um, and it looks like there's something in the Q&A, Michelle. Maybe that's an older question. Oh, that's great. Support groups with people who have long COVID. That's yeah. a great one. Find support groups, absolutely. Those could be remote. They could be um, you know, in person, whatever those support groups might look like. Even finding materials, articles, or newsletters or other types of materials that might help the person better understand what might be happening in terms of the long COVID. So this is Cheryl again. Um, so we talked about her job as a librarian, librarian having difficulties uh, because of brain fog going through um, and, and actually, you know, updating her database. Um, She's having a hard time keeping up to date. She's having a hard time, uh, you know, identifying and researching new books. What would be some supports or resources that can help Cheryl identify? Um, or what, what are some, some ways that these supports or resources can help Cheryl? So we talked about the skill last time, kind of that skill of slowing down, the skill of maybe deep breathing. Now is what are some of those resources that might help? Okay, it looks like we have something in the chat. Uh, yes, coworkers. Coworkers, yes. Using coworkers. Looks like something else just popped in. 
Music and journaling, excellent. And journaling, yeah. Perfect. So let's move on. Um, we, we've kind of already talked about this, um, but again, just to, to really highlight that we could be looking at the fun functional implication from both sides. Is there a skill that you can teach the person to help mitigate some of these implications or the limitations due to the long COVID symptom, or are there supports or resources that could help the person? So now we're kind of coming to our to our end of the presentation where we really encourage you to think about how you might use these skills and in your work with individuals who may have long COVID. So you can use the chat, unmute your mic. So how might you use goal planning or skills teaching or resource and support development to help people that you're working with who have long COVID? And what might get in the way, I think is kind of that critical piece that when we think about some of those strategies, really recognizing what might be a challenge to implementing some of this and thinking through that challenge is really helpful. I think this is a great question, Joni. And I know for me, I always think what might get in the way is my own knowledge of skills teaching. I've done it, but I feel a little rusty. <laughs> so that might certainly be one of my challenges of getting in the way. I don't know if anyone else uh, can relate to that or have other thoughts about how you might use goal planning or skills teaching or resource, uh, resource de development. Um, oh, someone has posted funding could get in the way. Mm -hmm. Is this a reimbursable uh, service? Yep. So finding out if it's a re reimbursable service. Um, I know for me, what might get in the way of the resource or support development is not not knowing all of the resources that are in my community or, or available. So it would be helpful um, to create a list of and, and maybe work with my team on kind of developing a pretty comprehensive list of different types of resources and different categories that might be helpful. And we have another one, a lack of resources assist clients in navigating how they stay connected during the pandemic, assist with technology. So technology can definitely be a big barrier and, and helping people stay connected too. Yep, so that could get in the way. And so if you think about how to remedy that, you know, maybe look into any sort of laptop or technology loan resources that might be available. Anything else, Michelle, before we move on? No, nope, I think we should just keep going. So just to summarize, we reviewed some of the impact of long COVID symptoms specific or, or COVID itself, uh, some of the impact of COVID on individuals with SMI. Michelle discussed the functional assessment tools that could be useful to really identify what some of those areas might be that we can assist individuals to either learn skills or develop resources. And we also talked about smart goal planning in a very, very brief overview of smart goal planning, but talked about how um, it's important to refocus or help individuals to, to focus on what the current goal might be and how that current goal might have changed or might have been altered because of the pandemic and kind of revisiting that goal. Are there any questions or comments? And Michelle and I, I'll, I'll put my um, information in the chat. And if you have any questions that you think of, uh, certainly feel free to email me. And uh, next slide, please. Let's go over some of the resources, Joni. Yes. Um, we have references. Lots of, references. <laughs> Lots of little teeny tiny references. And then the resources are grouped in 
employment. So some information about the job accommodation network that could really be useful when you're looking at resources and supports, uh, psychiatric rehabilitation specific resources, COVID specific resources, uh, some of the assessment resources that Michelle discussed are, are all listed here. And then the SMART goal resources are here as well. Um, nice overview of SMART goal planning with some worksheets and uh, a video from the Khan Academy, kind of overviewing what SMART goal planning is. And we are at our evaluation slide. I think Michelle's going to Yes, we're funded through SAMHSA to provide this training, and as part of receiving this funding, we are required to submit data related to the quality of this event. I really invite you and encourage you to complete a brief survey about today's training. You can access the training by scanning the QR code or clicking on the link. Um, we have a podcast. You should check that out. It's pretty cool. We're going to develop a new season soon on Flourishing at Work, and our new season is coming out on uh, best practices for helping people live with uh, serious mental health conditions. And if the recording of this webinar will be mail, uh, available on our website to view this and any of our previously recorded webinars, just go to the link and that's the QR code there. Check back often because we're adding new things all the time. Next slide, please. There will be a certificate of completion automatically emailed to all online participants within seven days of the broadcast. Next slide, please. We thank you so much, Joni and I, for joining us today. Please feel free to follow us on social media to stay informed about our upcoming training and events. We hope you have a fabulous day. Yes. And next slide. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank Enjoy you so much. Uh, how else can you get the survey? All right. Hold on one moment. Um, I will drop it in. Oh. Drop it in the uh, chat. Just one moment. Sorry, I'm not super fast with this. I believe that also gets sent out to you. Um, yes. The survey information it is also linked here in the chat. So thank you for asking. We really appreciate your time. We really appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, and we hope that this was helpful in your work with people with serious uh, mental health conditions and long COVID. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.